the recording. Okay, so some of you guys have probably heard of Fourier series before, um, but I wanted to kind of motivate it and understand it a little bit because it's a pretty common um, tool that we utilize, okay? So in general, what I talk about when I'm talking about any kind of a, of a circuit or something like that, I have some kind of a dynamic system. And so basically my input to that guy might be a cosine wave. So here's, here's a circuit. Um, if I wrote down the differential equation to this, you guys should know that there's two parts of the response by now. There's a steady state response and there's this decaying exponential we call the transient. And if I had a second order system, what would be the difference? Let me ask you that. What's the difference if I had a second order system? How would the response, the output voltage here be different? If it was second order instead of first order, what would change? Well, I mean, so the, the capacitor and inductor will trade stuff back and forth through that. I, recall, I don't know if that's what you mean. Be, if I recall, it could be damped, under damped, critically damped, or um, over damped. Well, both, both of those statements are correct, right? Um, what would be true about my transient response in particular? It would go away. It would eventually go to zero. Well, and that's, that's true no matter what order system. But I had a, this, this is first order. If I had a second order system, what would be different about the transient response? Uh, the Either transient way. response would be in the form of a, an exponential times a trig function, right? That's Not necessarily, say. right? So well, it's, it's, uh, I guess that's for underdamped, isn't it? It's, well, it's always e to the s1t plus e to the s2t, right? Yeah. Which, which might become trig functions, or it might just be exponentials, okay? It all depends on what, on what in that case. What's here? Whether it's damped or undamped or- The roots. Right, the roots. And the roots determine whether it's, whether it's undamped or underdamped or critically damped or whatever, okay? So, all right, so just, I wanted to remind us of that. We're still gonna have to know that for later, for later. All right, but we're, we're moving on to a new concept. Now, if, if I have this particular case, I put a, a voltage that is a cosine into that circuit, V out steady state, what is the form of V out steady state gonna be? If I put a cosine in, what do I get out in cosine. steady state? Cosine. And, and usually what I say is I, I get V out cosine omega T plus phi. Now let's say I knew what Omega was. All right. So I, I know, I always know what Omega is cause I know the frequency of the input. So let's, let's just say it was Omega was equal to one. All right. For sake of argument. Guessing this as my steady state solution means what? What's, what's the implication of that as my steady state solution? Uh, the, after some amount of time, it's just going to look like that. After some amount of time, it's just gonna look like this. And the only thing that's different about this than the input. So this, this input, let's say is cosine omega t. So in this case, cosine t. The input and the output look almost exactly the same except the circuit has somehow changed the amplitude and changed the phase, okay? So in other words, it's scaled it. What, it mean, what that means is that by it, the, its scaling has changed. It's either bigger or smaller, or it's shifted to the left or to the right. That's all it means, right? The frequency never changes, okay? That's always true. Now, <clears throat> because of this, what we said is, um, you know, if I wanted to guess the steady state solution, we didn't put the cosine in there, did we? What do we do instead? How, how did we represent this thing instead? We didn't want to do B cosine T plus phi. How did we represent it? Euler's identity? Yeah, which, which says what? Uh, one over two E to the J theta plus. Yep. I could, I could do exactly what you're just saying, Tim. I could, I could do one half E to the J omega T plus one half E to the minus J omega T. Or I could say it's the real part of something, right? Yep. What's it the real part of? What is this guy over here the real part of? B. It's B E to the uh, uh, omega T plus, or J omega T plus J phi. Yep, like that. Sorry, I wrote what he said a little bit differently, but that's still true, 
Okay. And what we said is I can plug that into the differential equation. And all and, and what we do is we said we actually just plug in the B e to the J phi e to the J omega T, plug that into the differential equation. And then what happens, what happens to the e to the J omega T terms when we do that? Where do they go? You guys remember? So what did it, what do we do to try to solve for the steady state solution? It's only been a week since you did this. We took a guess. Well, you I remember so something about the S state, right? Like S just squared. To solve, to solve the steady state, we plugged it back into the DE. Yeah. And what happens to the E to the J omega T term when you do that? I should be able to end up canceling it out, right? Yep, it can it cancels out, right? And I just I end up with just the B E to the J phi. Okay. That's that's all that I've got when I do that. And so what that leads to is it says, I don't even need the time domain stuff. And you guys end up looking at this in circuits two instead of saying, Well, I don't need a differential equation. I can just say this is R and I can say this is one over J omega C, and I can just analyze it like it's an algebra problem again. All right, just like we did in circuits one. All right, <clears throat> that's, the, that's the problem that, that's a lot simpler with this, okay? Now, what happens if I had this as the input? So I have a square wave. So first of all, you guys, have you guys heard the term square wave before? I yeah. have. Okay. Not have everybody's... Some maybe heard of a square wave, but what a square wave is, is it's basically, it looks like what in digital systems you guys call a clock. Okay, in other words, what you see is it, 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 uh, it has a sharp rise by definition, you know, going from zero to one and then back from one, one to zero and then zero to one and back and forth like that. All right, I say this guy has a period T, but he's not a sine wave, okay? Can so, it be defined as a sum of uh, unit steps? It could be defined as a sum of infinitely many unit steps. Be a lot of unit steps, <laughs> but you could do that. Okay, you could totally do that. Um, I don't want to do it that way. All right, um, I want to leave it as as this. So Nate, you came in. Which of the cameras not working? Oh, okay. <laughs> So you're back on your phone anyway, <laughs> sorry. Um, so if, if I look at this waveform here, if I gave you a sine wave and I said, tell me what the steady state solution is for V out, okay? If I gave you a sine wave, you don't need to do differential equations, do you, right? You can use impedance and you can say, you can, you can say that V out is equal to V out, the phasor for it is one over J omega C over one over J omega C plus R, right? Times V in, whatever the phasor of V in is. I can do that if my input is what? What is the implication of doing impedance analysis? What do I have to have to be able to do impedance analysis to get a steady state answer? It doesn't have to be an AC circuit or an AC source, I should say. Okay, I and more, more specifically, not just an AC source, but what kind of waveform does it need to be? What kind uh, of waveform is always using? What's that? Cosine. So yeah, it has it has to be a sine wave, and I and I say I use sine wave generally, cosine or sine it needs to be one of those. So normally you guys are gonna gonna get it gonna get it into cosine form. So if I told you I want to figure out the steady state value of V out, if this guy over here, the square wave, is my input, then can I do the same thing? Not really, because it's instead of being a continuous thing, it's sort of like a DC source that just turns off suddenly, right? Yeah, that's sort of what it looks like, yeah. This guy is not a sine wave, and so that impedance analysis thing doesn't work. However, what Fourier series says is he actually is a sum of sine waves, all right? And we're going to use that concept here um, today to figure out how I could represent that thing as a sum of sine waves. Now, this idea of Fourier series happens all over the place, all right? That square wave that I just talked about is common in clocked systems, digital systems. So it's common in memory systems where I've got clocking 
that's going on. All right, so it's it's pretty common. All right, <clears throat> this particular input, I want you know, I want to talk a little bit more about it. All right, it it occurs pretty often, um, the square wave idea, but I want to talk about this general concept of of Fourier series a little bit. All right, what Fourier series says is that this waveform. All right. And I'm going to do it this way. This waveform, which is periodic, all right? And the definition of a periodic waveform is if I have X of T, it's equal to X of T plus capital T. So in other words, this, this is my general definition of a periodic waveform. So if I go forward one period, the value one period from now is exactly equal to the value right now. That's the definition of a periodic waveform. And this guy fits that definition, right? If you look at the value at zero, it's equal to the value at T and the value at 2T and the value at 3T. The value at T over two is the same as the value at T over two plus T, right? That's the definition of a periodic waveform. What a Fourier series says is this waveform consists of many different sine waves that add up to create it. Okay, and that's a useful tool because if I can do that, then I can go back to not doing differential equations and I can go back to impedance analysis, for instance, right? And it makes a lot of things a lot simpler to deal with. It's also helpful for trying to do various different pieces of analysis, right? So for instance, if I look at this particular setup, this is a setup that I would have if I had a, a PV panel and I wanted to hook it up to the grid, all right? So in this case, I don't want to go through all the details of this particular thing, but what I've got over here is a, is, a, is a PV photovoltaic panel, solar panel on one side, and it could be many panels, all right? Doesn't have to just be one, but then I have this circuit that's going to convert that guy from DC to AC and then hook up to a grid over here. Now, what's the grid supposed to look like? What's the, what's the power grid look like? Isn't it supposed to be a AC, so a so, okay. Uh, cosine wave? Yeah, it's supposed to, it should be a cosine wave, right? So it should look like that, except probably cleaner than what I drew, right? But it should look like a pure cosine wave. Over on this side, I get a pure DC thing. And in this circuit, I'm not going to talk about the details of the circuit, but what the circuit does is it measures the current going right here and into the grid. And it basically makes sure that the current looks like a sine wave coming out of this thing. All right, that's, that's its goal in life. All right, it tries to make a current source basically. But <clears throat> common problem that you find, all right, this actually, this waveform, I know this is scaled down because we measured it through a transformer. All right, this is what the voltage looks like here in Epic. Okay, so if I look at that waveform, um, kind of looks like a sine wave. Um, but, but also kind of looks like it's grown some shoulders or something, right? It's, it's a pretty nasty looking waveform. So what I can do is that, that kind of voltage is not just a pure cosine wave, right? Clearly not, right? What I can do is I can take some measurements on that thing and I can actually figure out what sine waves fit inside of that thing. So, so what I have here is just an example of I'm introducing a, num a thing here called a harmonic. And I'm basically saying that that waveform consists of a bunch of harmonically related sine waves. And I've got these numbers down here, three, five, seven, nine, like that. Now, one thing I typically do when I'm in, when you guys are all here and I can use the camera, um, let me see if, if I can make this work. Here, I'm gonna try this. All right, can you guys actually see my phone doing something there? I can't, I have to look at myself, I think, to make this work. Yes, we can see it. All I right. can see it. All right, so when I talk, hopefully what you see happening there is you get a bunch of spikes on that screen. Yeah. Any idea, any idea what I'm looking at here? That's the Fourier transform of the uh, audio wave. It is. So what it's telling me is the amp. So basically, so big words there, Fourier transform. I started talking about Fourier series. Now you mentioned Fourier transform. What is that? Uh, it takes the different frequencies of sine wave and breaks them down into one 
function that uh, yeah. where the x axis is the frequency of the sine wave. So yeah, what this is telling me is every time I speak, you see a bunch of lines popping up on the on the y axis. What it says is that each at each of those lines right there that come up, there's a frequency. There's sorry, there's a sine wave. There's a sine wave at each of those frequencies, and the height of those lines. What do you think that tells you? I think the height tells you. The amplitude, amplitude, right? The amplitude, the amplitude. Right? That's why it's loudest when I'm talking. I mean, when you guys talk, it, it picks it up too, but you guys are coming through my speaker, so it's not as loud, right? So when I, when, I, when I talk and I talk loudly like this, right, you see the amplitude's getting bigger on the screen, okay? So, so what this is saying is <clears throat> my voice apparently is made up of a sum of sine waves. And, and each, the, the x-axis there tells me the frequency of those sine waves. And if you look at them as they appear, it kind of looks like they're evenly spaced most of the time, right? It varies as I speak and say different things, but most of the time it looks like they're evenly spaced, doesn't it? Can, I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, vaguely. Yeah. yeah. So when they're evenly spaced like that, we say that they are quote unquote harmonically related to each other. Okay. All right. So we're going we're gonna to try to make an understanding of what that means here, here today to, or over the course of the next two lectures, really to try to make a sense of that term. All right. But I want to start with <clears throat> what this idea sort of implies and, and how we use it. So let's say I have this, this waveform right here. All right. The square wave. Now, if you look at that square wave, it sort of looks like, so it's got a period T. Okay. Now, can I fit cosine? So let's, let, me, let me just try to do this. I could fit sine into this thing. So let me try to do this. Let me, very bad drawing, right? But if you look, if I were to draw a sine, I could draw a sine and try to fit it into that square wave and overlay it. So in other words, that sine wave has the same period as the square wave and kind of overlays right on top of it. All right, so I did this in MATLAB here. <clears throat> where what I did was I said, all right, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna take a sine wave and I'm gonna to try to get that sine wave to align with that square wave. All right, so I got a, a square wave here that's going from zero to two and then it goes over like that, okay? And I can see that I drew a sine wave that, that aligns with that guy, okay? What's the problem with the sine wave that I drew? It doesn't quite align as nicely as I want to, right? It needs this to be guy, shifted upwards, right? It needs to be shifted upwards, right? So, so if I wanted to make that sine wave fit kind of neatly into the square wave, how much would you shift it up by? I'd shift it up by its amplitude, wouldn't I? Well, maybe not just its amplitude. It turns out I tried shifting it up by one. 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 Okay. In other words, you see the difference here. So in other words, I added, I took this guy here, this guy... First of all, what's the period of the thing that I drew here? Can you guys tell? Yeah, the period uh, is one. Yeah, the period is one. So I would write this as what? How would I the red waveform there? What would I write that as? It's some amplitude. I don't want to. It looks like the amplitude's not one. Okay. Uh, it looks like a sine, so you could say it's cosine minus ninety degrees. Well, I'll call it. I'm just going to yeah. call. I could do that. I could totally do that. I'm going to call it sine though. Just because it is. And uh, let's see, what would that be? Two pi yep. for the omega. Two pi yeah, t. Two pi t. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Now, what I did was I said I'm going to add one to that. All right. When I add one to that, I get this. And one is half the amplitude of the square wave. One is half the amplitude of the square wave. So now, now what I see is it looks like I got as much overshoot up here as I have kind of undershooting down here. And this guy lines up, lines up together. Now, for reasons that we're not ready to talk about just yet, I said the amplitude of this guy was B. Turns out it's actually four over pi. All right, now again, I don't wanna talk about why I know that is just yet. I'm just gonna say it is four over pi. All right, now, supposedly what I said, the whole idea of this Fourier series concept is that that square wave is a sum of sine waves. So I'm going to keep adding more sine waves to it. So this is what I have initially. I have some value. I'm going to call this guy 
for right now, what I have is one plus, I'm gonna call it B1 sine two pi T, okay, like that. And I'm gonna to add to that some other waveforms. B3 is its amplitude. I don't know what that is. I'm gonna call it B3 and I'm gonna say sine three times two pi times T, okay? So notice, what's the frequency of this sine wave that I'm adding in here? What's its frequency? It's three times the frequency of our first one. Three times the frequency of the first one. So what I do, we're gonna define some terms here. Um, in this particular case, I'm gonna say I have, a, uh, this guy has what I'm gonna call a fundamental frequency. All right. Fundamental, and I can see the fundamental. Basically, it's what is the sine wave that, or cosine wave that kind of neatly fits into this periodic waveform. That frequency of that waveform is what I'm going to call the fundamental frequency. And then I'm going to have frequencies at n times that frequency. And I'm going to call these guys harmonic frequencies. They're harmonically related to each other when they're integer multiples of each other. All right, and N is sometimes called the harmonic number. Okay. So when I'm talking about this B3 cosine three times two pi T, what am I talking about? Which harmonic number am I talking about? The third harmonic number? The third harmonic number, okay. And so when I add the third harmonic into it, I get that. Now notice the difference between these two waveforms, right? So this, this, is, this guy here is only adding in these two things. The next slide adds in the third. So this guy is one plus B1 sine two pi T plus B3 sine three times two pi T, okay? Now, what do you notice about, about, the, about those? What, that the red waveform in the two cases, what can you say about the red waveform in this case versus this case? It follows the square wave. Yeah, it's uh, following the closely. square wave more closely. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's getting more, it looks like it's getting more, it's, it's getting closer, getting more accurate was, was what Nate said, right? Um, what happens if I try more, do you think? You bring it in closer. Gonna bring it in closer, all right? So in this case, I have five of them, all right? So I, I see that it's gotten even closer. And then here, I have 99 of them, all right? So in this case, I've, I've put in here one plus B1 sine of two pi T plus B3 sine of three pi, oh, sorry, three times two pi T plus B five sine, what should I write for that guy? The fifth harmonic, how would I write that? Four, two yeah. pi T. Five times two pi T. Oh, sorry. Five. Plus B seven times sine, seven times two pi T. And this, in this particular case, this goes all the way up to B 99 sine of 99 times two pi t. Now, one question might be, so somebody wanted to say B4 right after I did B3, which is logical. Um, technically I could have, you know, so if you look at this, if you look at my harmonic numbers here, I have three, five, seven, I'm gonna have nine, 11, 13, keep, keep going all the way to 99 here. I only have odd numbers here. That's not going to be true in general, but just so happens to be true in the case of this sine wave or this, sorry, the square wave. So to make that square wave, I have what we call odd harmonics to make that happen. Now, for right now, today, I'm not going to talk about, there's a way of computing B1 and B3 and B5 and all those things. There's a way of computing that. We're not going to talk about that today. We're going to get to that next week. But somehow what this, what this sort of says is, any periodic waveform can be comprised of these little sine waves and cosine waves, right? It could be actually comprised of both of those. 
And when we're doing Fourier analysis, what we're doing is we're basically finding out what these amplitudes are, okay? And we're finding out what those amplitudes are at these harmonically related frequencies. So when I did that thing with my, my phone there, all right, when I did this, right? So the x-axis here was the frequencies. So what it's, what it's telling me on the y-axis is the amplitude. So it's basically telling me these B1, B3, B5 values. Okay, so it's telling me those numbers. And that turns out to be really useful when we're trying to analyze, you know, waveforms that we get in the real world, or <clears throat> when we're trying to analyze circuits that have lots of waveforms, okay? What, or lots, lots of inputs. So in this case of what I have up on the screen, I have that square wave. I have technically many, many different sine waves in there. And this circuit, is, is what it's going to do. If I looked at the output of this circuit, depending on what the values of R and C are, one possible outcome of the voltage might be that it looks like this, okay? That it actually gets rid of some of the sine waves as it goes through it, <clears throat> all right? So we'll deal with some of those concepts a little bit as, as, I, as we proceed. But this is a really useful way of saying if I have a complicated waveform like this, like if my grid voltage looks like this instead of the pure cosine or pure sine that I expect it to be, this gives me a way of being able to analyze that. And we can, we can use this in a lot of different places. We can use it to analyze audio waveforms like I, like I did there with my phone. All right, it's a pretty, pretty powerful tool set for us to be able to use as, as designers, okay? So what this sort of says is if I had a square wave, I can actually take this square wave. I should have that there, okay? I can take that square wave, and if that square wave is my voltage source at the input, then effectively what I can do is I can say that that square wave is equal to the sum of a bunch of different voltages kind of put together with these harmonic relationships between them. All right, now, again, for today, we're not gonna talk so much about how to compute these values for any arbitrary waveform. We're gonna start with just some simple stuff, okay? And, and I wanna start with kind of a key concept um, because typically Fourier series gets defined in three different ways, okay? And some of you, you may have seen Fourier series depending on where, um, which math classes you might have taken. Um, there's basically three ways of representing it. What I'm not sure exactly how the book calls it, but the sine cosine version is the one that people typically start with. Um, there is also this kind of shifted cosine version, and there is what we call the complex version. Now, <clears throat> turns out that this one is, in my view, the most natural, because if I had a circuit and I put in B cosine omega t into a circuit, the output would be C cosine omega T plus phi, plus some phase shift. So to me, that second form there is probably the most natural. The, the sine and cosine is probably the one that you see most frequently. The complex is the easiest one to deal with math-wise, and I'm going to focus on it, okay? Because math, the math gets easier. When I, when I, math with exponentials is a heck of a lot easier than math with cosines. When I have cosines and sines, what do I have to do? I got to do trig identities. I got to do uh, integration by parts. That's annoying. You got to do it twice when you do integration by parts. It becomes really nasty. And so we, we do complex stuff. And we're going to be doing integrations again, right? Because it turns out our way of figuring out these unknown amplitudes here is going to be an integral. All right. But we'll get to that next week. So there's these different versions of this thing, all right? We're going to deal with these different versions um, over the course of the next couple of, couple of weeks, okay? Um, let me, what I want to do to be able to frame that and understand it is to think about the four different ways that I could think of a sine or cosine at any given frequency, all right? I, as I said, this class frames up everything we do in our ECE classes, basically from now until if you go to grad school, right, is, is everything is a, a cosine waveform. So much of what we do, audio, radio, um, power, all of those things are essentially some level of, of sinusoidal waveform. 
And even that square wave that I talked about, right, which is so common in digital systems, has in it sine waves. All right, so the sine wave is a really powerful tool for analysis. At any given frequency, what I can do is I can express that waveform in four different ways. And you've seen this. We focus the most probably on this approach. But we know that this guy is the real part of, right? How would I write that as, so real part of C e to the j phi e to the j omega t, right? The same thing I have down there. And you should, you should be able to remember that component, right? The real part of C e to the j phi times e to the j omega t. It's the real part of that. All right, now I wanna, I wanna jump to an example. And what I wanna do is I wanna basically derive the, all, all of those relationships together. There's a ton of equations in the book. I said that already. But what I wanna do is I wanna show you my way of thinking of this, which I think is simpler. It uses far fewer equations um, but relies on our knowledge of complex numbers, okay? So let's, let's start with this guy. So X of T, I'm given this waveform, three cosine omega T plus 45 degrees, okay? I wanna write that as the real part of something. What's it the real part of? Three e to the J 45 degrees, e to the J omega T, like that, okay? Now, <clears throat> I want to expand that a little bit and say I got the real part of, so I want to expand it in terms of, I want to put it in, put that thing into rectangular coordinates. So I got two complex numbers here. Here's one of them and here's the other one. And I want to put those two numbers in complex form, multiply them out and take the real part. Okay. So how do I do that? What do I do with the three E to the J 45 degrees? Well, you take the, I'm rolling this correctly, sine of. So what's, so three E to the J 45, how, how do I convert that into rectangular coordinates? Uh, it is the um, magnitude, yeah. uh, uh, rather, yeah, the magnitude times the uh, mm -hmm. cosine of phi uh, plus yep the magnitude times the sine of phi, right? Uh, well, and then of course you add j to the sine, yeah. Yep, yeah. like that, okay. That is three e to the j 45 degrees, okay? Now I can multiply that by e to the j omega t, which is cosine omega t plus j sine omega t, okay? And I wanna get the real part of that result, right? Because supposedly originally three cosine omega t plus 45 degrees was totally real, right? We said it was the real part of three e to the j 45 plus e to the j omega t. Just so we're clear on that, right? This guy would have started as the real part of three cosine omega t plus 45 degrees plus j times three times sine omega t plus 45 degrees, like that. So we can multiply out uh, like just by foiling uh, and yeah. end up with the, um, end up with the cosine times the cosine and the sine times the sine because the other parts would be imaginary. Okay, let's, let's do the whole foiling out real quick. So I got three times what? So I'm gonna have cosine 45. Cosine 45, times, cosine yeah. omega t. Okay, so cosine 45 degrees times cosine omega t. J cosine 45 sine omega t. And yeah, let me, I wanna group in the other, what's gonna be the other imagine, the other real term, right? It's gonna be uh, minus sine 45 sine yep. omega t. Yeah, if I do J sine 45 times J sine omega t, that's gonna be a minus sine 45 degrees times sine omega t. Okay, I have that. All right, and then I gotta do the rest of the foiling. So I could do cosine 45 times J sine. So I'm gonna get plus J cosine 45 
times sine omega t. And then I'm gonna have j sine 45 times cosine omega t. So plus j sine 45 degrees times sine omega t, right? Or no, times cosine, times cosine. Turns out it doesn't matter because it's gonna come out here. All right, so what's the real part of that whole expression? Uh, we drop the two components with J on them, and yep. so we get three cosine 45 cosine omega T minus three sine 45 sine omega T. Yep. All right. And the, and the cosines of just angles are, uh, uh, the cosine sine of just an angle is just a constant. So yep. That's right. that'll reduce down into the constant times cosine plus constant times sine form. Yep. Okay. So if I look at that, what this says is it looks like I have a cosine omega t plus b sine omega t, where in this case, it looks like a is the magnitude in this case. I'm going to say the magnitude, um, it's, it's some magnitude times cosine phi and B is minus some magnitude times sine of phi, like that, okay? Does that make sense? All right, so going back to this, I can see how I can relate now. I can make this relationship to this one and from this one to this one, okay? So I can, I can make all of those relationships pretty cleanly, all right? What about relating to this one in the middle, number three, right? That's actually the one that we're gonna use the most is that one. How do I relate that guy? How do I relate to that? All right, how can I relate? That's Euler's identity, right? So how can I relate to the Euler's identity? So let's, let me just write Euler's identity down, right? If I have cosine of theta, Cosine of theta is one half times e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta, okay? What this meant, and we're gonna have to look at this again maybe next week, but what, is, what does this mean? This basically meant that I can have two vectors, all right? Here's e to the j, or one half e to the j theta, here's one half e to the minus j theta, like that. Two vectors, one rotating this direction, one rotating this direction. If you think about that, if you added those two vectors, do they ever have an imaginary part? Right, this is the real, this is the imaginary. Do they ever have an imaginary part? They wouldn't. They, they cancel out, yeah. And, and their real part's gonna to be twice whatever their individual real part is, okay? And the real part's always a cosine, okay? So we're, we'll look at that. We looked at a video of that way back at the beginning of the semester, and we'll look at it again. <clears throat> but basically what this says is that I can think of a cosine as basically two complex vectors moving in different directions at the same rate, okay? All right, so help me out. How do I take, how do I use that expression to write this using Euler's identity? Three cosine omega t plus 45 is one half times what? Cool to three out front. What do I multiply that by? And what do I multiply that by? Wouldn't it be e to the j uh, omega t? then you could have times, or well, yes, you can do plus 45. Yeah, let's just do it as plus 45 for now. Okay. All right. And then you'd have plus e to the negative j with that whole shindig inside. Yep. Like that, okay. So what I'll say is I'll rewrite that as three over two times e to the j omega t 
times e to the j 45 degrees plus e to the minus j omega t times e to the minus j 45 degrees, okay? So <clears throat> it, it, now what I've done is I found another way, a fourth way of representing this thing, okay? Now, in and of itself, that's not particularly useful, but it ultimately makes it a heck of a lot simpler for us to do the computations of these terms, right? So the thing that I said is in Fourier analysis, we're usually trying to figure out what are these amplitudes, right? I'm given a square wave and I wanna figure out the amplitudes or possibly a situation where I'm given the amplitudes and I wanna figure out what waveform it represents. Okay, those are sort of the basic problems that we do. And they occur all over the place in terms of, of the real world problems that we come across. All right, so, all right, not all that particularly interesting to go through that analysis, but what I kind of see from this in general is that um, I found a way to relate. If I know, if I started out with number one up here, I could say that that was equal to the real part of Cn e to the j phi e to the j omega t. Now notice, um, I shouldn't have put that as N here. I put that as N only in that particular case. Cosine omega T plus phi N, right? So I, I put it like that, all right? What I did was I then, I then could do trig identities to expand that into a, this guy number two right here, okay? And so what I found when I did that is that AN was equal to CN cosine phi n and bn was equal to minus cn sine phi n like that okay so i figured out that relationship <clears throat> before all right i just went through that all right now that if i if i look at this and i said well i want to relate all those different series together i have some interesting ways now to be able to relate those series together and we're going to try to do that. So let's look at, so, so essentially what I'm going to do in, and I'm going to lay this out now, we'll talk more about it later, but essentially we're going to do all our analysis typically with the complex version of the Fourier series because it's the simplest for analysis. But then we can relate it to, to cosines and sines, which are the things that happen in the real world, okay? So we're going to, we're going to understand that there's a relationship. There's ways to, to transfer what this, what this, you know, concept is trying to show here is if I can express a waveform in the complex form, I can easily go back and forth between the different versions of the series. Okay. And we're going to, we're going to work through some examples of that. All right. So let's say that I gave you this guy, F of T equals two plus three cosine omega naught T plus four cosine three omega naught T plus 40 degrees. Okay. Now <clears throat> that guy right there, is a Fourier series. This is a sum of sine waves. And there's a couple of harmonics in this, in this system, okay? So if I look at this particular waveform, we have, you know, I, I gave the definitions before. I have a fundamental frequency, a fundamental, and I have harmonics, okay? Now back in the picture that I gave of the square wave here, okay? Back in the picture of the square wave where I tried to fit a sine wave into it. The, the sort of the definition of a fundamental is basically the, the smallest frequency that I can fit into that, that waveform, right? So the smallest frequency I can fit into this guy is omega naught. And then the, the other frequencies are multiples of that. So when I look at this particular picture, all right, so let's go back to here. I look at well, or this particular waveform, which of these is the fundamental frequency? Um, wouldn't it just be omega? Yeah, yeah, omega naught is what I've written here. Yeah, yeah omega naught is, is this, is that. And what about this guy? Which harmonic is, is the four cosine? Uh, wouldn't it be three? This guy is the third harmonic, okay? So I've got a three omega naught. So notice in general, and I'm gonna, I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with this sign or with this, this summation notation. 
But in general, what this says is I can have infinitely many sines or cosines in a given periodic waveform, okay? Infinitely many of those things in a periodic waveform. In this case, this would be a periodic waveform with a fundamental frequency omega naught, and then it would have in it um, some, other, some other terms at some other frequencies. And the other thing it has is this guy right here, right? Two. What frequency is that guy? The number two. Zero. Zero. He doesn't change, right? I could think of him as two cosine of zero T, right? What's two cosine zero T? Two. So sometimes that DC term is what we call the zero frequency term, okay? We'll talk more about that, all right? But that term sort of makes, should make a little bit of sense. DC terms have zero frequency. They don't vary. They're constant, right? There's no variation, all right? So <clears throat> what this says, let's look at this top equation here. F of T, this is a summation formula, all right? Help me out, how, how, do, how does a summation formula work? Right. Let's start. Let's assume I had um, n equal to zero. So let's. So I. This says from n equal to infinity to infinity. So n equal to negative infinity to infinity. I sum all of these different values here. So let's just say. Let's let's make that a simpler equation for a minute. Let's say I had negative two to n equal to inf uh, two. Okay. And I had alpha n e to the j n omega naught t like that, okay? So if I, if I just had from, and that's, that's not in general what I just wrote there, the definition of a, of a Fourier series, not from negative two to two, right? But I, I just, let's just say I had that summation. How would I write that out? How would I write that result? Somebody other than, than Philip or Nathan I thought you liked us. I want to hear somebody else's voice. How would I write that? What's the first term in that series? Would it be alpha negative two e to the j yep. negative two omega naught t? Yep. Alpha negative two e to the minus j two omega naught t. Okay. What's the next one? Alpha omega, uh, or alpha the negative one, yeah. Yep, e to the negative j omega naught t. Now what's the next one? Alpha zero times e to the j zero omega naught t. What's that equal to? E to the j zero is one, right? It's just alpha. Yep, just alpha. And I say alpha sub zero like that, all right? Um, and then I would add alpha one times e to the j omega naught t and alpha two e to the j two omega naught t. And that would be the whole thing, okay? Now let me ask you, if I looked at this waveform, if I have an e to the j omega naught t and an e to the negative j omega naught t, I can combine those, can I? What do they become? If you, they just if you had, cancel out? We're not going to cancel out. If I e to the j omega naught t plus e to the minus j omega naught t, what do we know happens when I've got two complex exponentials that have frequencies that are opposite to each other? I know there was a transformation we just did. Yep. Uh, they can become cosine or sine, right? They can become cosine or sine. All right. They can become cosine or sine. And, and what, what I basically will find is that I can combine them and we're gonna, we're gonna try to do that, all right? But I wanna, I wanna remember this basic expansion here and see if we can utilize this to put my Fourier series in a couple of different forms, okay? So let's look at this. this so I'll tell you what, this Fourier series, what, it, what, this, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at this F of T that I was given here and I'm trying to pattern match this F of T with the different elements that I have on the screen. So let me ask you this, looking at F of T as I've written it here, one of these terms, the two, 
the three or the four, one of these terms should be alpha naught. Which one is alpha naught? Wouldn't it have to be three? Two. Two, right? It's the one that's just a constant. Oh, duh, that makes the most sense. Okay, all right. So I, at this point, I already know that this guy is alpha naught equal to two. Okay, now let's expand f of t here. So I get two. So <clears throat> let's put three cosine omega naught t. Let's use Euler's identity to get that guy into complex exponential form. So three cosine omega naught t, how do I use Euler's identity? Euler's identity was e to the j theta equals one half. Sorry, I can do it different ways. Cosine theta is one half e to the j theta plus e to the minus j theta like that. All right. So what would this be here? Would it be four times like oh, let's, let's start let's start let's start with this guy right here. Oh, sorry. Would that be three somebody times? Else, somebody other than Nathan. I want to hear somebody else out there. Three times uh, e to j omega naught t. Yeah. Three e to the j omega naught t. What else? <coughs> would that be three over two? It would be three over two. And it wouldn't be just e to the j omega naught t, right? What else would I have in there? Plus e to the negative j omega naught t. Yep plus e to the negative j omega naught t, like that, okay? And then I do something similar probably for this, this guy over here, this four cosine three omega naught t plus 40 degrees. All right, what would I do for it? What would I do for that two. guy? Uh, same thing, so it'd just be like two. So four over two, AJ. two, yeah. E to the j what? Three omega naught t? Yeah. Plus what? Plus the angle. Yep, plus 40 degrees. And it'd just be like the inverse of that plus like E. So E to the minus J, three omega naught T. It's easier to do standing up. Omega naught T plus 45 degrees. Like that. 40 degrees. 45. 40 degrees, yeah. Boy, I'm not going to be able to fit it. Like that, okay? So let me use more space this time. Okay, so that, if I look at this, I'm gonna, I'm gonna separate out the terms a little bit. I'm gonna say that it looks like I've got two, and I'm gonna take this guy and I wanna, I wanna maybe I'm gonna group terms in a different way. Let me do it this way. I'm gonna say, it looks like I have a two. I'm gonna put a two in the middle, okay? And I'm gonna add that to three halves e to the j omega naught t, like that. That's this term, right? So I've got, basically let's check off the terms. I did this one, I did this one. Now I'm gonna do this one. I'm gonna put it over here. Three halves e to the negative j omega naught t, like that. So now I've got all three of those terms added together. All right, now I wanna deal with these guys with the, this one has a three, so the frequency of this guy here is three. So just understand this right for a second. What's the frequency of e to the j omega naught t? What's the frequency of that? One. Not one, I know where you're going with that. It's the, the, it's, it's the first harmonic, okay? But the frequency of this guy is omega naught, okay? What's the frequency of this guy over here? Negative omega naught. Ne negative omega naught. Negative omega naught. Now, in so in terms of what that meant, we said, you know, when we looked at e to the j omega naught t, it's a vector, right, in, in the complex plane. e to the negative j omega naught t is down here. 
And we said the frequency is the rate at which that vector moves as a function of time. All right, we'll look at that again on Tuesday, maybe some visualizations of that. But one of the vectors is moving in the counterclockwise direction. The other one is moving in the clockwise direction. So their frequencies, one's negative, one's positive, okay? So what am I gonna write over? I'm gonna write two more terms in here. I'm gonna write one on the left side and I'm gonna write one on the right side. Which one do you think I'm gonna write on the right side here? Which one am I gonna put over here? Wouldn't you just want the coefficient two? The first one. The first one, right? Two e to the j 45 degrees times e to the j three omega naught t like that. Okay. Not 40. Sorry, I keep writing 45. 40 degrees. All right. And what did I do? I basically pulled the e to the j 40 out in front. Okay. What are, over on the left side, I'm going to put the other term. What's the other term going to be that's left? Two times what? Two times what? E to the negative J40. E to the negative J40 times E to the negative J3 omega naught T. All right. <clears throat> so... What I'm going to do is I'm going to say that this guy looks like I have alpha minus three e to the negative j three omega naught t plus alpha minus one e to the minus j omega naught t plus alpha zero plus alpha one e to the j omega naught t plus alpha two or sorry not alpha two but alpha three e to the j three omega naught t okay and so looking at that i said that this thing is a fourier series that i can express as apparently alpha minus three is equal to two e to the minus j 40 degrees alpha minus one is three halves alpha zero is two Alpha one is what? What's my alpha one going to be? Three over two. Three halves. Or three fourths, three halves. And alpha three is what? Two. Wait, uh, two e to the j40. Two e to the j40, like that. Two e to the j40. All right. So basically what I've said is this waveform consists of components at in, in this form of the Fourier series, there's a component at, at E to the, a component with a frequency of negative three omega naught, a component with negative omega naught, omega naught, and three omega naught. So this guy has a third and first harmonic and a DC term, an average term. Okay. Now I could relate that into the forms, the other forms of the series too, if I wanted to, right? In other words, I could relate it to these, these different guys. One of the things I wanna look at here real quick is what's the difference between, let's say, this form of the series and this form of the series? Well, one thing I notice about this is this, this one begins at negative infinity, whereas these two begin at one. Why is that? Could it be because of the function itself? The third one's an exponential. Well, and so so what is it about the exponential that means that the bottom one goes from negative infinity, whereas the other two go from one? I mean, you're right, but what is it about the function that makes that happen? Oh, isn't the negative value in the cosine going to be equivalent to its positive value in that same cosine? Well, not, not quite. It's right thinking. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. So what, what Nate, Nate's here in the room and he's basically suggesting what's right, which is that if, if I have E to the J omega naught T moving in the positive direction and E to the negative J omega naught T moving in the opposite direction, that always combines into a cosine. So I have to have a, 
an exponential vector moving in the negative direction it, at the same rate as a complex exponential vector moving in the positive direction. If I have both of those together in tandem, I get a cosine. So I have to have the positive and negative complex exponentials to get just the positive cosine. Again, it's a lot of, a lot of math just to, to express a cosine waveform, I, I get that. But the, but the <clears throat> application of this gets a lot easier if I move into the complex form of the series, okay? Now, fundamentally what this sort of says, and we're gonna deal with this a little bit more, all right, is, is just this idea that if I had this waveform down here, right, four cosine 10t plus four cosine 30t plus 30 degrees, what this thing says, and the way that I, the way that I think about it is that that waveform f of t is, can be made up of these fundamental building blocks, okay? So one building block being the number one, one building block being cosine 10t, one being sine 10t, one being sine 20t, one being cosine 20t. And I basically need to figure out what's the right amount of that sine and cosine I need to put together. Visually, this is exactly what this equation down here is saying, okay? And we're gonna think about it like this, but the question is, is how do I figure out the A1s and the B1s and the A2s and the B2s? There's lots of stuff to figure out to that, all right? And we've got a couple of, couple of steps that we gotta go through to be able to figure that out, all right? <clears throat> but this is a pretty fundamental concept um, that you'll be looking at in the next homework assignment, which will be coming out next week once the project is, is come due, all right? So the beat, the beat goes on next week and we've got new material to start thinking about, okay? All right, so that's it for today. So I'm gonna stop the recording. It's been a while since I've...